In this class we're going to talk about data collection techniques. Now some of the material in this class will overlap with the material from other videos, from other classes. And it's wise to ensure that you've looked at a wide range of classes uh, up to this point. And then add this material to your notes from the previous classes. So for example, in this class we'll talk about uh, questionnaire design for example and issues surrounding the use of questionnaires well that will have been covered in other videos so add this material to the notes you've made from the previous set of classes and get a more comprehensive picture what I'm going to do here of course will be will have a slightly different perspective so it's worth going across as well so let's start first of all let's talk about the the role of research now, research may be used to investigate some process or phenomenon. So we use research to gain an insight into some process or, or some particular phenomenon. In industry, for example, we may look at research into uh, buying patterns, customer behavior, customer needs, or into motivation in the workplace. So it looks at some process or some phenomenon and research gives us an insight into those issues. It may lead to a better use of resources in industry. It may highlight some areas of inefficiency, for example, and point to a better way of, of working. It may help our understanding of various phenomena or phenomena uh, for example, suppose that event A leads to event B, but we don't know why. Now, in this case, research could help. In business, sometimes we may observe that uh, if the company cuts the price of its output, more will be sold, or perhaps the same amount would be sold. Now, it needs to know why. Why, why is the output not increased, or why has the output increased, depending on what, what happens. Why are customers price sensitive? Now research can indicate this, it can indicate what's in the customers minds, how important is price, it may be that their incomes, their, their disposable incomes is more important, or the image of the product is more important. So. It, makes, it tries to make a, a logical connection between the two events, say a reduction in price and increased sales, or it may be the sales remain the same, or it could even be the case that the price is reduced and less is sold, which sounds strange, but it could be the case that less is sold because now customers are seeing the product as inferior or not desirable because it uh, it's cheap. It's seen as a cheap product and, and not fashionable. So uh, research can shed light into these background events and make connections. Now data collection procedures, well the first one I suppose would be experimentation. This is most commonly used in the natural sciences in physics, biology, chemistry and so on where experiments can be set up and can be controlled. So there are a large number of variables but the experimenters, the scientists, are able to control a lot of the variables and just vary perhaps something and observe its effect on something else. That's called a controlled experiment. In business, generally speaking, we can't experiment. So in business, uh, <coughs> it's very unlikely that we can experiment. But we can have survey methods, we can use techniques for collecting data by simply asking respondents how they think about a product or, or how they feel about a product. Or we can conduct surveys. That's certainly um, something that business can do. We also have observational facts. Uh, the researcher may observe, make direct observations of some event and record what he or she sees. 
So that's a possibility. A more extreme one is, is partist, uh, participation. Um, participant participation. Um, in this case, the researcher gets involved in the situation. So if, if it's an issue, let's say, within a company, let's say motivation, poor motivation amongst the workers, then the researcher may become a worker and try to experience what the workers are experiencing to try and find out what is it that's causing such low morale. Interviews are widely used in business. Try to interview customers or interview suppliers or interview staff about certain issues to try and get a picture of what is causing what. And there's also, of course, focus groups where uh, a small group of people are invited to meet and to give their opinions under control conditions with a facilitator who will prompt them and lead their discussions and, and try to induce or pull out what they feel about certain issues. Now let's move to steps in the data collection uh, procedure. Well, first of all, the objectives of the research must be clearly stated. Uh, it will be impossible to collect appropriate data unless the objectives are clearly stated. The, the whole idea of the research is it should be focused in on trying to get an insight into something, into some issue. So the objectives of the research should be clearly stated. And indeed the target population must be identified. Who's going to be researched? That should be identified right at the start. And a time scale for the research. When does it start and when will it finish? If there's no finish date, research can drift on, uh, on and on and on. So there must be a time scale, a, a time when the research will finish and the findings will be written up and presented. Now given the nature of the proposed investigation, an appropriate data collection instrument should be selected. So having identified the objectives of the research, the target population as well, and the time scale, then some appropriate instrument for research should be identified and selected. Um, it could be a questionnaire, or a focus group, or in-depth interviews, or whatever. But some technique should be identified and set out the precise method of data collection. State why it's the best one under the circumstances and state how, how it will be conducted. But set out that it's the best under these circumstances and give reasons for that. Why, if you're going to use interviews, why interviews? Why not uh, questionnaires? Why not focus groups? So state exactly why that technique is selected. And then <coughs> operationalize it. Um, train the staff so that the, the research staff know exactly what's required and are familiar with the, the technique that's, been, that's going to be used. So ensure that the staff are adequately trained and that the information coming back will be reliable. The questions could be pre-coded to aid the analysis of the data collection. So pre-coded questions means that it's easy to analyze the questions later and there are um, computer uh, programs which can help in analyzing uh, data but 
sentences, for example. Computers are not very good at handling, say, English sentences. So a certain sentence, a question, for example, could be coded as Q1. Now the computer will identify Q1 and associate Q1 as that question. And this technique often crops up with um, software that analyzes questionnaires. So pre-code the questions to enable it to be um, analyzed efficiently. And pre-test or pilot test the investigation to iron out any last minute bugs. In other words, try out the, the questionnaire in advance, if it's a questionnaire. If it's an interview, try out the questions in advance. Ask uh, uh, people or pick a, a small sample of people and ask them to see if there are ambiguities in the questions or the wording is wrong or the sequence of the questions are, are wrong. So iron out any issues by having a pretest. And finally, conduct the question the investigation, conduct the questionnaire or the interviews or whatever. Finally do it. So there are steps in the data collection uh, approach. Now a survey questionnaire, well there are several issues to be considered with the survey questionnaire. Um, <coughs> the type of question to be used, for example. Will the questions be open-ended or closed questions? Uh, open-ended questions, how do you feel about the changes made to this product? That's an open-ended question. Uh, the respondent may give any answer they wish associated with that question. Presumably the, the answer they give, of course, would have to be relevant. But uh, there is no, there's no check on, on what the respondent says. Now a closed question would be something like, what do you think about the improvements to this product? Are they A, very good, B, good, C, acceptable, D, not too good, E, bad. And one of those would be ticked. That's called an attitudinal scale. But it's a closed question. The respondent only has one choice from five. Whereas with the opening question, the respondent could say just about anything. The wording of questions must not lead to bias. Uh, it's very easy to word questions which do lead to bias, to, to lead the respondent in a particular way. Don't you agree that the government is doing an excellent job? That's a biased question. The language is leading the respondent to agree. Uh, leading questions are biased and should be avoided. And for that reason, pre-testing is such a good idea. Pre-testing means ironing out questions that lead the respondent and introduce bias. Check the, the question sequence and the possibility of overlap or repetition. It's very annoying when the same question comes up twice in the same interview. The respondents think, I've already answered that question, so why is it coming up again? And again, pre-testing is important to get rid of any overlap of this nature. Some questions may benefit from the use of prompts and aids. Um, however, they should not bias the respondent. So sometimes if it's difficult to describe the situation, the, res the, the researcher may show an illustration or uh, show a copy of what they're talking about to help the respondent to make a decision to answer the question. But care has to be taken that the illustration or the picture or the artifact that's been used should not bias the respondent. So again, pre-testing, uh, piloting the 
the work in advance should have highlighted many of these issues and perhaps suggested solutions for the issues. So that is the importance of pre-testing. Now starting the questionnaire, well step one, write down the purpose of the study and list the information required at the end. Simple. Write down what's the purpose of the study and what's required at the end of that period. Without this information nothing really happens. Uh, the purpose of the study should be clear and uh, the information required at the end should also be clear. Uh, it may be that the purpose of the study is to investigate uh, the marketing, the, the effectiveness of marketing a particular product. And the information required at the end, um, what improvements can be made to the marketing initiatives, uh, what changes are required. So there's a list of what the purpose is, purpose of the study, and what information is required at the end. Second, list the main sections of the study and also uh, list the content required to complete each section. So look at the, if it's a questionnaire, look at the various sections and make sure that the sections are justified. Make sure the questions are relevant. They're not wasting the respondents time and they don't overlap and they don't repeat. So look at the main sections and see what what's required from each section. If it's an interview the same should apply. The questions asked should be grouped under particular headings and queried under that heading. There might be three or four questions relating to a particular issue, three or four questions related to a separate issue and so on. Note any sensitive questions or uh, areas of the investigation and find acceptable questions. Some questions are perhaps too sensitive, it may be political or moral or uh, relating to some aspect of even the business. It may be that uh, it's asking workers what they feel about the management in a business. Well, it's too sensitive. The workers are intimidated. They don't want to lose their jobs or they don't want to uh, upset the management. So they may give false answers. So the information has to be sought, but it has to be sought through questions which are acceptable. And it's a particularly tricky area to work in. The fourth step is to ensure that all the information is accurately recorded and free from bias in the recording process. It's important that the information is free from bias. If it's biased, it's worthless. It's misleading. It can actually be dangerous to the business. It may lead to bad decision making in the future. So recording the information should not lead to bias. And step five is to ensure that the questions are clear and unambiguous, that they're simple and short, easily understood, they must be relevant to the study, and they must be either open-end or closed-end as appropriate, and they must, should be uh, tested out in the pre-test, in the pilot survey. The questions should be coded, and the questions uh, coded up so it's easy for analysis at the end. And if there are attitudes being tested or inquired into, pick an appropriate scale. It's common in um, a lot of attitudinal research work to use the Likert scale. Uh, sometimes it's five points. Uh, like a lot, like, neutral, dislike, dislike a lot. That's a five-point scale. But there are all sorts of criticisms of the use of attitudinal scales. And it would be worth going online and checking out the criticisms of attitudinal testing. 
there's a lot of material online that you can research for yourselves but it's also included in many of the videos in this module. Step 6. Make the process short and not time consuming. When collecting information it's always best to make it short and not time consuming. Time consuming means the respondents get bored, they start to give false answers or answers which are not properly thought out. So long questionnaires lead to boredom and the possibility of inaccurate questions. Now let's move to the phasing and wording of questions. First of all ask clear, short, specific questions. That's important. Clear questions. Clear, easily understood and short. Not complex questions. Not long worded questions. Short questions. Looking for very specific answers. Um, try to use everyday words. Don't, don't try to intimidate the respondent by having sophisticated language that's perhaps unnecessary or unsuitable uh, under the conditions of that particular survey. Ask only one question at a time and avoid multiple barreled questions. A straightforward question. Don't ask, do you like this or that or that? It's too complicated. Uh, do you like uh, this product or would you prefer the product to be painted red? Well, it's two questions. Do you like the product? Yes or no? Would you like the product painted red? Yes or no? That's two questions. Don't ask two questions as one question. It's confusing. The whole survey should be short and well organized. Um, as I said, to avoid boredom, to avoid the respondents just giving answers just to get it over and done with. And avoid, uh, as I said earlier, leading questions and bias. The questions that are asked should be seen as neutral. They're not leading the respondents to praise the company or the product and they're not leading the respondent to criticize the, the company or the respondent. They're neutral. And again, I keep saying this, but the pretest should indicate ways in which this can be designed and helped to, to be designed in a way that it is neutral. Questionnaire layout. Well, the researcher should find it easy to use, and this will uh, give a more professional image. The questionnaire layout, layout. If, if a researcher is asking questions using a questionnaire and filling out the questionnaire for the respondents, the questionnaire should be well designed. It shouldn't involve the researcher flipping between pages, forwards and backwards, and looking for places to write. It should be well designed. It should be logical and straightforward. Notes for permitted guidance and reminders should be appended to the administered questionnaire. It's a design issue, but sometimes on the page there might be a wide margin with notes for the, uh, for the researcher in the event of something or of some answer, uh, say the following or move to question 10 or whatever it is. Um, so there might be some guidance in the margin on the page for the researcher in the event of a certain response or non-response or, or um, some confusion. But generally speaking, simplicity, simple questions, straightforward questions, asked clearly, they prevent confusion. But the instructions should be rigidly followed. That also ensures consistency. If the instructions are rigidly followed every time, then it's possible to get uh, a survey done in which all of the respondents, all of the people who gave answers, uh, have 
been faced with the same approach and that gives consistency and as again as I said in the past the, re the answers should be easily recorded by the researcher now questionnaires well final points on questionnaires make sure that the questions are uh, in a sequence that's logical the questions must follow one to the next and be answered in a logical fashion um, both the respondent and the researcher must understand the questions there must be straightforward questions that are easily understood and try to get both parties motivated and interested the respondents must be keen to participate and the researchers must have enthusiasm as well they, they mustn't see it as a boring activity because that will rub off on the respondents if the researcher feels bored and depressed by the whole activity the respondents will feel low as well and will not want to participate and if they do participate they'll want to get it over and done with quickly Now the interviewer instructions well make sure that the researcher is fully briefed and clearly understands what's required it's imperative that the researcher understands the questions understands the sequence of the questions understands all of the issues associated with the research and attempts to um, address the requirements of the research in a logical and yet friendly format and to that end the researcher should practice the questions in advance should study the questionnaire carefully well in advance should be fluent with the, the questionnaire should be able to move smoothly through it and know where all the questions are and the language that's used and be able to give neutral prompts if required if someone doesn't understand a particular word have a prompt for the word have a, a substitute word which will not lead to bias data management well set a, a questionnaire identification number each questionnaire should be identified and devise a coding sheet for the questions so that the answers to the questions are recorded in a coding sheet so the questionnaire number and the answers to the questions are recorded in a, in a coding sheet this will make the analysis easier um, make a code book to hold all closed used for uh, analysis all the 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 closed questions that are used for uh, an, uh, in the questionnaire make a code book so uh, for example a closed question could be um, as I said earlier uh, do you like the color of this product and it's A B C D E where A is I like it a lot and E is I don't like it at all so we have an attitudinal scale and that's a closed question so have a code book that uh, is able to handle that sort of um, response and in that way some sort of overall picture can be um, worked out from the various responses it will be very crude because adding attitudes together is not necessarily a good idea there are problems in doing that and besides which the intensity of feeling uh, with which each answer is given is not being recorded but open-ended questions are much more difficult and a code book does not really apply to the open-ended questions so select methods for data management uh, how will the, the data be managed when it's collected will it be entered into a computer is there a, um, an acceptable computer program that will help uh, 
do the analysis. It all, of course, depends to some extent on the, the size of the sample. If it's a very small sample, it may be done just in the office uh, by looking through the questionnaires and working out the responses to each question. It could be, as I said, manually tell, uh, telling up the answers and sorting the answers. It depends on the size. Or it could be, if it's a large um, survey, it may need a particular package. For example, often used in the social sciences is a package called SPSS, the Statistical Package for the Social Sciences. And that's often used to analyse questionnaires. But there are other specialist software packages available. Questionnaire preparation. Well, depending on confidentiality requirements, questionnaires may include name and address. But there may be confidentiality issues so that the name and address is not included. Um, and it's important to honour confidentiality and to respect confidentiality if it's given or if it's required. It should have the date of the interview. That's acceptable. So the date of the interview should appear as well. And um, this would be general data for recording purposes. And only straightforward and simple but important questions should be asked. Straightforward questions only. Complex uh, questions generally speaking should be avoided or broken down into simpler formats. It may be, by the way, interesting to record where the interview took place as well, the place of the interview. Um, it may be relevant in some sort of analysis later. For example, did the interview take place on the street with a lot of traffic or where, where did the interview take place exactly? And for that matter, what was the what was the the weather like? If it was outside, was it raining, or was it a nice fine day? Again, that can influence the quality of the uh, results. If it's raining, people may not want to answer, or if they do want to answer, they want to get it over and done as quickly as possible. So it depends. The questionnaire, the researcher should lead into the questionnaire with uh, easy to answer and familiar questions. It's like warming up the respondent. So make very easy, straightforward questions to start with the more uh, detailed questions coming later. And leave space for the interview to write down any relevant information. Uh, there may be loose comments or additional comments that were not really solicited or the question didn't require but were just volunteered by the respondent. So leave space for the interview to record it, um, the interviewer to record it so that the people doing the analysis will have an understanding of what the question uh how the question was answered, I should say, the context in which it was answered, so that it may be an issue of bias or uh, it may be an outlier. The results uh, for that particular respondent may not fit the pattern and the extra comment may help to explain why. So we've looked in this session at questionnaires and mentioned the other forms of data collection. Um, important topic and it's also dealt with quite extensively in other videos and other classes uh, in the modules so please look at those as well. Um, use the video to uh, make notes, use the forward and the backward button and the, the stop button to make notes off here, pad out the notes with your own research and your own thinking and uh, get a, a good set of uh, notes overall into this topic. It's an extremely important topic in the context of business. 
But that's all I'm going to do in this session, so I'm going to leave it at that and say thank you for watching.